Good afternoon from Brussels and welcome to this webinar, which is called Developing Large-Scale Solar Projects in Africa with First Solar Modules. My name is Raffaele Rossi and I'm Senior Policy and Market Analyst at Solar Pro Europe. And, uh, and I very much look forward to this webinar supported by First Solar. In this webinar, we will be addressing the challenges that developers and investors are facing today in the development of large-scale plants in Africa. And we will talk about how the strands can be mitigated. Let's start with a quick look at the agenda. Where, um, as an introduction, we'll be briefly presenting the African solar PV market, illustrating how the market grew in the past years and what uh, uh, the projections for the near future are. Then I will introduce and give the floor to our distinguished speakers from First Solar and Exim, which will provide their input presentation. After the webinar, there will be um, an opportunity for a QA session, and we would like to hear the questions from the audience. So you're very much invited to submit your questions. Here you can see how to submit your question, find the question box in the right hand of the screen and type in your question. We'll make a selection of the questions and we'll try to address them after the input presentations. So to set the scene without further ado, let's now have a quick look at the solar PV market in Africa. The data based from our Global Market Outlook report, which we publish on a yearly basis, shows a very vibrant solar market in Africa. And you can see that while only 10 years ago hardly any capacity had been built, the expansion of the solar fleet in the region has been dramatic. We reached the first milestone in 2013, 14, sorry, when cumulative capacity reached the gigawatt scale for, for the first time. And since then, the solar markets in Africa has expanded rapidly and has reached the over eight gigawatts by the end of 2020. If we look at the future outlook, uh, the trend is not set to end anytime soon in our projections. According to our five-year GMO scenarios, which are developed looking at low, medium, and high projections, so three different scenarios, the cumulative capacity in 2025 could reach as high as 47 gigawatts. In our most likely central scenario, this would equal to 33 gigawatts by the same year. And this is equivalent to a fourfold growth compared to today's levels. And you can see that the um, yearly percentages of growth are almost uh, for every year in the range of 30% or even more so. In terms of annually installed capacity, uh, the gigawatt scale has been reached already in 2018, three years ago. And even in a year characterized by COVID like 2020, the market managed to stay above the two gigawatt gigawatts annually installed. We also are very upbeat about uh, our projection for future growth and we expect a 40% growth taking place in 2021 and sustained growth in the following years. Uh, we anticipate that the market should reach 7.5 gigawatts installed per year by 2025 under our central medium scenario. Many countries are particularly interesting in terms of solar deployment. Um, and importantly, these countries are located in different regions across the continent. Um, for example, uh, you have South Africa, Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, Nigeria, which all come from, from quite different geographies. So you can see from the slides the growth we expect in some of the most prominent markets. And when do uh, we anticipate the gigawatt scale according to the different scenarios? So you can see that for all this, this country listed, at least for the high scenario, gigawatt scale of solar fleets are expected at 2025 latest. It's interesting also to see the compound annual growth rate according to our medium scenario, um, which shows the rapid pace in which the transition takes place. And lastly, if we look at the term key business segments, we see two main applications. One is the IPP segment, which is a, is a key pillar in the power sector reform. These projects are in the range of 5 to 25 megawatts of size in order to facilitate green integration, uh, whereby the sale of electricity is agreed with a single buyer, which is usually the, the national utility. And secondly, we see uh, the CNI segment as a very, very flourishing one. These projects are green interaction mainly due to the possibility of getting independence from an often unreliable grid. 
and importantly a key barrier to this development is due to the fact that this sector is new and thus tailored financing is hard to come by without a track record of success. So thank you for listening to this introduction. I now would like to introduce our distinguished speakers for today. Um, so I would ask them to, to turn on the cameras um, and uh, um, I would like to welcome to the discussion uh, Ashish Gupta and uh, Lionel Reis from First Solar. Ashish has more than 27 years of experience in the energy industry. He joined First Solar in 2015 and is now the company's business development director for Africa, the Middle East CIS region. Whereas Lionel is First Solar technical sales manager supporting the business development activities in Europe, Middle East and Africa. We also have with us Craig O'Connor, who's the Renewable Energy and Environmental Experts Officer at US Exim. Craig works closely with renewable energy exporters, international customers, and project developers to create a bankable project structures. So we'll have first a presentation from Ashish and Leonel, and then we will give the floor to Craig to complement the presentation. So um, now we would give the floor to the first solar colleagues and look forward to your presentation. But I believe that before that, we have a poll which I would like to, to ask to our audience. Um, I will read out the question and you will be able to, to see uh, yeah, the, the possible answers you can choose. So how familiar are you with the first solar FinFIC technology? So please select if you are very familiar, only familiar, you have heard about it, or if you're not familiar at all. So let's give a few seconds for people to respond. Okay, poll is over, and we can see that most of the attendees have heard about First Solar Thumb Film Technology. However, uh, we also have a number of participants that are either familiar or very familiar. But I, I think that we can gather that at least half of the attendees are not uh, very familiar with the First Solar Thumb Film Technology. So I think it, this can be a good scene setter and uh, it's a good start for, for this presentation. So please, Ashish, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rafael. Okay, so hello and greetings to everyone. And uh, as I saw in the poll question and the results, uh, half of the audience is not uh, familiar about first solar or partially familiar about first solar. So today we are going to present about first solar and its thin pin PV module technology. So I hope by uh, end of the webinar, you will get a good insight on the first solar, its technology, and how do we help you? How do we contribute in your solar journey through its, our differentiated PV module technology? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so first solar is one of the most bankable globally and the largest uh, solar manufacturer in the Western hemisphere and offers a most sustainable thin film PV modules, which produce higher energy over the life cycle. Uh, we serve all market segments, such as utilities, distributed generation, which is called CNI as well, as well through developers, IPP, EPC. Uh, Pass Solar was founded in 1999, and since then we have shipped over 30 gigawatt modules globally, and we have enabled almost $19 billion worth of project financing using one of our most bankable technologies um, available. <clears throat> um, people who don't know us, we are a global solar, solar company with the first solar associates positioned around the world to serve a growing list of customers and different regions where the solar energy is coming up. Uh, we have three manufacturing sites which are located in Ohio, here, uh, in Ohio, USA, Dongnam, uh, Vietnam, and Kulim, Malaysia. Uh, our current manufacturing capacity is about 7.9 gigawatt. But looking at the market growth and increased demand of our technology, First Solar has recently announced manufacturing capacity expansion in USA as well as in India. And by end of 2025, First Solar would have a capacity of 
uh, approximately 17 gigawatt. <clears throat> Now, first solar has supplied uh, PV modules pretty much in every continent of the world. And our technology has been used in small scale as well as the large scale utility projects in different kinds of segments. We proactively uh, collaborate with all the leading balance of system equipment suppliers and ensure that our customers get access to our ecosystem partners uh, so that they can design their PV plant more optimally and more cost effectively. Uh, these are some of the examples of the project uh, where First Solar has supplied this PV module technology. Uh, by no means, uh, this is the full list. This is a, like a fraction of the projects which I'm uh, presenting uh, during this webinar. <clears throat> but most specifically in Africa, uh, we have been a technology partner in the solar project in Zambia and Burkina Faso. Uh, but the important thing to mention here is that first solar PV modules have been installed and being operated in varied weather conditions around the world globally, including one of the most harsh uh, environmental conditions like Middle East, Chile, and other uh, part of the regions, part of the world. <clears throat> Sorry. Now, PV technology is... Um, no more a niche technology and it's becoming a mainstream technology day by day and hence we believe bankability is the most important aspect of getting your project financed especially if it is a non-recourse finance bankability is super critical and super important for your projects so with first solar high quality and reliable product its financial stability and long-term track record of uh, performance you can have a bankable project which you can get um, easily financed, non recourse or limited recourse. So, First Solar checks all the uh, key bankability criteria uh, related to uh, financial and manufacturing bankability, product reliability, and supply chain bankability. So, First Solar carries uh, a very high Altman Z score, which is 5.95 which is one of the key indicator or index of measuring uh, financial stability and bankability. So with regards to uh, product reliability, First Solar has featured as one of the most reliable PV modules in PVEL report consistently for last two years. <clears throat> now let's have a quick view of our technology, which, uh, which ensures safety to human health and as well as the environment. The, the manufacturing process of thin film PV module is highly sophisticated, but it's very simple. First solar PV module is a glass on glass module and a, a, a thin semiconductor layer is encapsulated between the two protective sheets of glass and then coated with an in, industrial laminate material. First solar PV module use very little semiconductors like micron amounts of cadmium telluride, about one, one to two percent of the amount of semiconductor material which is used in typical uh, crystalline silicon uh, solar modules. So another example of um, how we minimize our life cycle uh, impact is uh, through our innovative manufacturing processes. The first solar is fully integrated manufacturing process, uh, require less energy, less water, and semiconductor material than the crystalline silicon module. And that's why thin film modules are having the lowest carbon footprint available in the market. A first solar's continuous automated uh, manufacturing process transform a sheet of glass into a complete series six module in less than 3.5 hours compared to if you take a conventional crystalline silicon module which has a batch processing it can take up to 3.3 3, 3 or 4 days uh, unlike crystalline silicon module um, 
which is basically having a batch man manufacturing process, as I mentioned, thin film PE module is a continuous process and it is manufactured under one roof, which enables first solar to achieve full control on the supply chain and quality of the module. <clears throat> first solar thin film modules have one product uh, structure, one product architecture and with a single set of bill of material. That's very important for uh, our customers, uh, developers or EPCs. Uh, these modules are one of the most tested modules uh, in the industry, and these are tested beyond the IEC standards by independent third parties to ensure module performance in extreme weather conditions. First Solar runs a, a rigorous product reliability program under which uh, continuously we take the modules product uh, out of production and test them regularly um, as, as reliability is one of the key consideration and key value we want to bring it to our customers. <clears throat> so I will chime in here and pose the second question of, of today. Uh, the poll asks the following, how important are sustainability criteria such as recyclability and environmental footprint to you? So you have to choose between four options, very important, moderately important, somewhat important, and not very important. So please express your thoughts on, on this question. How important are sustainability criteria such as recyclability and environmental footprint to you? Okay, I think we have uh, absolute majority that reckons that sustainability criteria are definitely very important with 73 percent. Um, the remaining share almost entirely talks about moderately important sustainability criteria and just a few said that's not very important. So I think we have a clear result from the poll. Back to you Asish. Oh, thank you very much and uh, very glad to know that uh, majority of the audience believe that sustainability criteria are very important for this industry. And um, how do I change it? Yeah. And that's why um, it's important that we see that where and how a PV module and its components are manufactured significantly impacts is environmental profile. Manufacturing PV modules uh, using a fully integrated process in countries, especially with a less carbon intensive grid, it results in the lowest environmental footprint of any PV technology on a life cycle basis. Uh, due to our resource efficient manufacturing process, uh, and everything happens under one roof, it's a continuous process. FS modules, first solar modules, have a carbon footprint that is approximately 2.5 times lower and a water footprint which is three times lower and an energy payback time that is two times faster than any conventional monotrust line silicon solar panels on a life cycle basis. So in summary, Source Solar provides the leading eco-efficient PV technology as our module produce uh, more energy um, at a lower cost and with the smallest life cycle impact. <clears throat> Now, how are we delivering the responsible solar today? From the environmental perspective, uh, we are addressing environmental impacts across the product life cycle by providing PV modules with the lowest carbon footprint, a low, lowest environmental footprint, as we discussed in the previous slide, offering high value recycling services. That is also something very important for environment and reducing our operational impact by committing to go 100% renewable by 2028. We are going to be one of the RE100 company by 2028. From the social perspective, uh, we are committed to operating a tightly controlled integrated supply chain. And if you look at the government's governance side, we have been publicly reporting on our sustainability performance for a decade now and became the first PV product to be listed in the EPEAT registry uh, for sustainable electronics. And we, we take, uh, we are very proud of that achievement. Now, as part of the 
uh, responsible solar program. First Solar started the first recycling program 10 years ago, and we are the leading, we are having the leading recycling program at each one of its uh, manufacturing facility. Module, our module construction is such that it enables the high value recycling. And as part of our recycling process, uh, we are able to recycle more than 90% of our module. Uh, with that, um, uh, th this was uh, last slide. And with that, I thank all of you to listen to me patiently. And I look forward to your questions at the end of the webinar. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashish, for the presentation. I think now it's, uh, it's time for your, your colleague, uh, Leonel, to, to present. But before that, we have another poll for, for the audience. And the poll asks the following question. When making a solar module procurement decision, do you account for lifetime energy in your analysis? And the answers that you have available are yes, sometimes, no, or I don't know. So when making a solar module procurement decision, do you account for lifetime energy in your analysis? Let's wait one or two seconds more, and then we can see the results. OK, once again, we have a clear majority um, answering that yes, they do account for lifetime energy in your analysis. We have sometimes 18%, just a few say no, and a little remaining share doesn't know. So I think this is a, a good uh, survey result to give the floor to you, Leonel. I think you want to, to talk a lot about that for a, for a little while now. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Rafael, and thank you very much, Ashish. Um, and hello, everybody. Um, I hope also, like Ashish, by the end, by the end of the call, by the end of, of this webinar, uh, we can change that 63% to 100% so that you all consider lifetime energy in, in your projects. And in this second part of, of this presentation, I will enter more into detail about the technical differentiators of first solar thin film technology, uh, focusing particularly on our Series 6 uh, product family and its main advantages. So among some of these advantages, we have the superior temperature coefficient in our modules, the spectral response, and the linear shading behavior that at the end of the day, it means more energy per watt than other technologies. Our modules have a best-in-class durability and reliability, as well as an industry-leading long-term degradation rate. Also, the fastest installation times and lowest mounting hardware costs, thanks to the innovative frame design and the dual junction box. And um, our modules don't suffer from power losses, from uh, light-induced degradation or light and elevated temperature degradation as uh, it typically occurs in crystalline silicon modules. And similarly, thanks to the nature of the semiconductor in our modules, uh, our modules are inherently immune to cell cracking and micro cracking. And just as Ashish mentioned earlier, uh, uh, thanks to the unique composition of our modules and the unique manufacturing process, the first solar modules have the best environmental profile in the industry with the lowest uh, carbon footprint, the lowest water footprint, and the fastest energy payback time. So when, um, when we talk about performance and energy yield advantage, first solar modules have a superior temperature coefficient that can bring up to 3% additional energy in comparison to crystalline modules in hot climates. Uh, also a better spectral response that can account for up to 4% more energy in humid conditions. And thanks to the, well, the, uh, thanks to the way the, the cells are defined in our modules using laser scribing, 
and not wafers as in crystalline modules. Our modules have a true tracking advantage that uh, translates into approximately 1% of more energy than crystalline modules on trackers. And due to the uh, undermount frame uh, in our Series 6 modules, we have there is reduced soiling and better snow shedding by avoiding um, accumulation of soiling at the edges of the module. So all these characteristics are things to be taken into account when uh, calculating the lifetime energy of a project, a part of poll questions. And this translated or this reflected into this map, uh, you can see that uh, can account for up to uh, 75 or 8% additional energy, additional uh, like specific annual energy yield advantage uh, from our Series 6 modules over monoperc modules. So this map is putting all these factors together, what I mentioned uh, earlier, humidity, temperature, irradiance, of course, and uh, also shading in the different locations uh, over a year, right? So taking the, into account the changes, the daily changes and seasonal changes, um, I think there is there is little or there's uh, little to add here. I think the image speaks by itself, but thin film cattail modules are particularly interesting in locations like Africa because of the hot and humid conditions. And this is something quite important and, and relevant when choosing the technology, the right technology for your projects, because uh, factory rated power doesn't always equate to high performance in the field. So we, are, we go beyond the question of efficiencies of the modules, is the lifetime energy what also matters in the projects, more energy per watt, and that can be achieved thanks to a superior temperature coefficient, better spectral response, and other characteristics that um, that our modules and cattail technology have. Um, talking a little bit more about failure modes that are characteristic in crystalline silicon modules, our modules do not suffer from uh, light induced degradation or light eleva and elevated temperature degradation, LID and LETID, that are um, uh, that that happen in crystalline modules regardless of like regardless if they are P type or N type, uh, both both types uh, suffer from LID and LETID at different at diff like in different degrees, and these degradation effects are unfortunately often not included in the nameplate of, of these modules. So LID can account for up to 5.5% of the power losses during the first year of, of the project. And uh, boron doping technologies during the manufacturing process is thought to, to be the main responsible of this type of degradation. So first solar modules do not have boron in its composition, and uh, that make uh, that that's the reason why this this uh, uh, degradation mechanism is not present in 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 first solar uh, technology. Also for former series, and in the case of LETID, unlike LID, uh, this occurs. Um, during several years. So it's not occurring in the first year, only it occurs uh, between years two and five, even longer in some cases. And even within a same product, uh, same manufacturer, it can vary wildly. So it can account uh, for up to 7.5% of the power losses during the lifetime of the, of the modules, even taking into consideration the recovery from this effect that, 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 that can happen in, in this period. This has nothing to do with, um, with, the, uh, with the boron doping. It's, uh, it's still not fully understood in, in, in the industry, but it's 
being raised more and more often by third parties to be taken into consideration when assessing a project and to have an accurate uh, an accurate calculation of of the energy yield uh, so that uh, the developers consider this also when 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 planning and um, you can be reassured you can be you can have peace of mind that these these effects do not occur uh, in in first solar modules LTID is characteristic of silicon materials silicon technologies so uh, first solar modules are free from LID and LTID in the case of cell cracking and micro cracking in PV technologies it's a it's a similar situation um, as Ashish mentioned earlier our semiconductor uh, our our semiconductor material uh, is less than than four like three to four uh, uh, micrometers thick in comparison to 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 crystalline um, crystalline cells that is that are approximately 180 uh, micrometers thick and just to have a perspective of uh, how how thick is that our our uh, our cat tail uh, uh, semiconductor is less than 2% of uh, the thickness or 3% 3, 3 of the thickness of a human hair. And because of that, the material is much more flexible and is not so susceptible to, to fracture on, under stress as it's the case for crystalline cells. And this stress can occur from hail, from wind, from snow loads, uh, also during transportation and installation. And to to reflect like that that confidence and that how how sure we are about about that um, first solar modules are warranted against cell cracking and micro cracking, and this is the first and only of, uh, uh, of warranty of of its kind in the industry, and it's explicitly mentioned in our in our warranty terms and conditions. So this is this is something to be taken into account. Uh, cell cracking is one of the main uh, failure modes in, of, of crystalline technologies, and uh, they are not always noticeable or perceived with naked eye and um, uh, affect the lifetime of, of the projects. But by the way, it's worth mentioning that uh, like in the latest scorecard, of uh, PVEL, um, there were uh, um, among two two of the new categories that were added this year were LID uh, and LTID performance, as well as some uh, mechanical stress tests. And and first solar uh, um, was rated as top performer also. Um, moving now. Talk, talking about the mechanical and electrical specifications of the module. In, in this image, you can see the rear side of the module showing the undermount frame. It's an aluminum frame that protects the module. It gives robustness to the module, and it can only be seen from the back side of, of, of the module. It has a crossbar in the middle. Um, and besides the reduced soiling and better snow shedding that I mentioned earlier, it allows for two different options for for uh, uh, for mounting the, the, the modules. It can be using top clamps or through an innovative uh, design that has uh, shared uh, bottom mount clamps uh, that are inserted from below the module and can bring the installation times as as low as two seconds per per module. The, the module, the Series 6 modules, are also designed to be mounted in portrait mode uh, in order to benefit from the linear shading response of, of the module. Uh, our modules don't have diodes. That would mean that if the module is shaded 10%, uh, if it, there's a surface um, that of, of about 10%, that would mean only 10% of, of power losses, unlike crystalline modules that, that would, be, would be much higher than that. 
And to conclude this, this technical part of the presentation, uh, this is an overview of the electrical specifications of, of, of the module. Uh, our Series 6 module is a high voltage module. It, it has a, it's approximately five times the voltage, the module voltage of a crystalline silicon module. And the strings, the 1500 volt DC strings, um, are, are meant to have six modules. There are different configurations with multi string harnesses, um, there are different possibilities there. And also uh, looking again at the rear side of the module, you can see uh, a dual junction box that brings uh, benefits for the connection of the modules, electrical connection of the modules, a simplified installation process, uh, quite near, uh, it's, it's a very uh, neat wiring uh, process with, with, uh, without the need of wire management at module level. So basically just one cable that would be connected to the adjacent module um, uh, going to the to the to, to the junction box on the right hand side of of the module and with this i conclude this part thank you all and looking forward to your questions i hand over back to raffaele and for the next section with with greg Thank you, Leonel. Indeed, thanks for, for your presentation. Very insightful. And I'm sure there are many questions popping up and uh, we can take them in the Q&A session later. But before we move on to, to the third speaker, uh, you can see the poll that popped up on your screens. And the question is, what will be your key consideration for debt financing? Uh, would you be looking at interest rate, fixed or viable, or rather debt tenor, FX exposure, or perhaps all of the above? So what will be your key considerations for debt financing? Let's see what's, uh, what's the feeling in the room about this. So it seems that uh, all of the first three are important considerations with perhaps a little preference to interest rates, um, but then I would invite Craig to um, open their camera and the mic so that uh, he can tell us a little bit more of his insights from a financier perspective. Craig, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you very much, Raffaele, and thank you all for joining us today. And excellent presentations by Ashish and Lanell. And I think um, by way of background, Exim Bank has been working with First Solar. I've known them for about 20 years, I've been at the bank for going on 29 years, been very active within the last uh, 12 years. And as you're gonna see banks, uh, when they make a loan, particularly for project finance, and we're making 18 year loans, we obviously have to have great confidence in the reliability of the technology, which we absolutely do. And so I thought that, that Lionel's presentation in particular in, in uh, showing you the technical aspects are very important. And so again, very important for the banks. So briefly today, I'll give you a quick overview of the Export-Import Bank and how we have been actively supporting First Solar and uh, other projects as well. So by way of introduction, Exim Bank was created by Franklin Roosevelt in 1934 uh, to provide financing where it otherwise uh, wasn't readily available. And I appreciated the poll uh, because um, uh, interest rates, tenor, and foreign exchange risk is something we'll I'll touch upon in this presentation. So Exim Bank finances the export of US made goods and services. Um, we look for a reasonable assurance of repayment. I'll give you an indication of what that might look like. We can provide direct loans and that's a fixed rate, uh, US dollar loan. Uh, and we're able to go out to 18 years. Exim Bank is part of the OECD Export Credit Agency Group along with uh, UK Export Finance or COFAS of France, Herme of, of Germany, Nexi of Japan, et cetera. So within that grouping, we have certain uh, rules of engagement, I, I would say. And so uh, we want to increase the maximum support we can for renewable energy. And that's currently 18 years. And so that's direct loan of 18 years. We can also provide loan guarantees, obviously in dollars, but also in other currencies. And so that's something that may uh, come as a natural hedge to the foreign exchange risk that uh, you all mentioned was important. 
So we have a long history of being in the forefront of financing projects important to U.S. exporters and international customers, particularly in times when access to commercially viable financing is constrained, but you can also have emerging markets in Africa that are developing their capital markets, developing their banking system, and if Exit Bank can, can add greater support to that, uh, that's a, a role that we're keen to play. So I, I tell people that we, I don't work on commission, maybe fortunately or unfortunately, but it's a, it's a way to say that uh, Exit Bank will, will support the U.S. made goods and services and will be typically the most cost effective way of, of doing so. And right now our current 18 year fixed rate, which is based on U.S. Treasuries, every month it's reset and then it's fixed for 18 years at the time of board approval or the first disbursement. And actually recently that's just come down to 2.48% uh, for our, our September, October rates. And it's around 2% for our 12 year rates. So again, I mentioned um, full faith and credit, 100% U.S. government guarantee of a loan that a commercial bank might make. And so again, that loan can be in euros or, or other uh, technologies. We focus on renewable energy uh, because it's one of Exxon Bank's charter mandates. So every four to five, four to five to seven years, Exxon Bank gets a new charter from our Congress. And since 1992, we've had special language to increase our support for environmentally beneficial exports. Uh, that's why I have my, my current position as a renewable energy officer of the bank. And uh, we, we wanna be proactive in, in terms of uh, increasing our support. So our approach to lending, I mentioned reasonable assurance of repayment. There's many ways to do that. Uh, one could be a, a corporate borrowing approach. Um, the first presentation about the growth of obviously grid connected large scale projects, but also CNI and uh, and distributed solar, something else we're seeing. And I'll go into that uh, later. So we, we could look at the existing uh, financial statement of, uh, of a borrower. And that could be, again, for large scale uh, grid connected project, or it could be CNI. Uh, doing credit analysis of their financial statements, uh, uh, et cetera. It could also be project finance, and that's non-recourse project finance, where typically uh, the repayment for Exxon Bank's loan is, is based on a long-term power purchase agreement with a credit-worthy off-taker. And clearly, uh, because it's non-recourse, everything has to work. And so that's why uh, Ex the fact that Exxon Bank is more than happy and willing and able to support 18-year loans for First Solar. It should tell you everything you need to know about our faith in their technology. Uh, there's also kind of a, what I would call a hybrid approach in structured finance, where uh, it, it's not full-blown project finance with, with all the bells and whistles of structuring, uh, but it may be one or two structuring elements to support a uh, corporate balance sheet. I mentioned direct loan. I created this slide as more of a reference for you, so I won't go into a lot of details here. Um, but it, it, as it sounds, a direct loan, we're also able to provide guarantees as I'll get into um, for capital market issuance. So for, for me, the always the most interesting part of any presentation is the case studies, the actual deals that you've done in the field. And so very proud of the fact that Exit Bank was the first international financial institution to finance a solar project under India's national solar mission and one of the first, I think we're number two, to finance a project under the state of Gujarat in India's uh, solar. And so not only did we finance the first project for India's national solar mission, but we financed the first nine. And that's what we hope to do in Africa, working with Ashish and Lionel and others, is um, again, if we can, we can create a franchise where you have a, a standard power purchase agreement um, where it's strong backing, and basically we, we can standardize the, uh, the, the terms and conditions, then I think uh, you make a huge difference. And we, we saw that in India. Um, our portfolio is, is uh, supported close to 300 megawatts and well over $350 million. And most of that was for solar modules. But, you know, Exxon Bank is, um, again, a catalyst a lot of times. So while we finance uh, the export of U.S. made goods and services, and obviously that's, that's for solar, but it could also be Next Tracker. It could also be storage companies like Tesla and EOS and ESS Inc. or Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy. Obviously, Siemens Gamesa is a European company, but because they make wind turbines in the U.S. state of Kansas, we're able to finance those internationally. And, and so we, we finance U.S. exports 85 percent, but we also finance local costs uh, equal to 30 to 50 percent of the total U.S. export contract. So in many cases, we can be the sole source of debt supply 
but we can always um, collaborate with others and, and crowd in additional financing. And so some of the projects that we, we did in India, Reliance Power, uh, Solar Field, Mahindra, and again, uh, this can, kind of gives you a indication of our, our projects with First Solar. So it's it quite a number, um, a good indicator of uh, the, the type of uh, confidence we have in the projects. And we, and we work very closely with First Solar. We work very closely with the customers. And so we're you know, keen to hear from you if you have a project you want to discuss. And uh, again, we, we have no hidden fees or agendas. It's, it's all about making financing available for, for projects. Um, Quickly, I mentioned loan guarantee, 100% full faith and credit. This is different from a lot of export credit agencies that provide conditional insurance, and maybe it's 90% insurance, but that adds a lot of liquidity. And one, one project that uh, was so new, I didn't have time to put it into my slides, but last week, we ExxonMake had its annual conference, and our deal of the year was with First Solar. And the deal of the year was with uh, a Zacapa project in Guatemala, and this is a 10 megawatt CNI project, distributed solar project, where there was a 35-year lease of the solar project. Exxon Bank provided 100% guarantee to Provident Bank of Boston that made the loan to Kruger Energy of Canada. Kruger Energy of Canada used First Solar's modules. They found that with First Solar and Exxon Bank 18-year financing, very competitive source. And in fact, this the paper mill that's using the solar module they're going to save 100, 000, over $100,000 a year on their electricity bill, plus uh, have reliable power uh, as well. So we, we see this is a, a huge growth area. Obviously, CNI, as was mentioned before, as well as Grid Connected. We also provide a guarantee of capital market issue. And th this is where you know the concern about foreign exchange risk, which, again, if you're borrowing in dollars and you're earning uh, you know, revenues in NARA or other currencies, and you, you know, you've got a natural... Uh, uh, exposure, but we're also able to guarantee uh, capital market issues, and those could be uh, bonds that are issued in, in Nigerian Nara, for example, or Moroccan dirhams or other, other currencies. Uh, again, 100% U.S. government guarantee of repayment makes this investment grade, and so I think that unlocks the door to a lot of, a lot of financing and also crowds in a lot of financing. So that's a quick schematic of how it works. Um, a quick... Uh, kind of step-by-step step our trust structure, custodial receipt structure about how this actually works, uh, but it's uh, it's pretty straightforward. So I'll just leave that, I won't go through that, leave that as an example for you. And here's a schematic of, of this uh, of this diagram as well. So clearly we're interested in, in supporting short, medium, long-term financing to creditworthy customers. We've been active with First Solar. I mean, First Solar is the main uh, U.S. supplier of solar modules and clearly work in a lot of a lot of jurisdictions. Um, again, Exxon Bank has a congressional mandate, but clearly it's a priority for the Biden administration uh, to build back better, build it with solar, and not, not only building back better, but it's building back cheaper because solar is so cost competitive in so many areas. And so we're uh, keenly interested in, in providing financing where it's not otherwise available. We don't have a minimum project size. The Zacapa project I mentioned, that was an Exxon Bank loan of about $8.5 million, but we're happy. We're, we don't have a maximum project size either, so it could be well into the billions, which we hope that will be the case. So we welcome your ideas and projects, and, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. And on my side, thank you, Craig, for this very insightful presentation. I think it attracted a lot of interest from, from our audience. We still have some time for, for some questions, so I would invite all the speakers to reactivate their camera so that they can engage with the audience. Um, let's start with a question for, for Ashish, perhaps. You've mentioned the expansion of your international manufacturing footprint. Uh, how much capacity would you add in the US and in India, and what's the time frame for that? Okay. Um, so we announced two factories recently, one in US, one in India. So both factories are going to have manufacturing capacity of uh, between 3 to 3.5 gigawatt per annum. Uh, US factory at Ohio is going to be functional by mid-2023. And India facility, uh, manufacturing facility at Tamil Nadu state will be by end of 2023, will be um, producing module on a commercial scale. 
Thanks. Um, I see a question perhaps uh, for, for Leonel. Uh, you discussed large-scale ground-mounted application in your presentation. Can first solar technology support floating PV or BIPV or rooftop applications? I believe that is the case if I understood from Greg's correct presentation about the Guatemala project. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rafael. Yeah, that's right. So first solar supports all segments, uh, including floating and rooftop uh, applications. You also mentioned in your presentation CNI in, in Africa, so that's the main focus. Currently, we are not pursuing a residential segment. Uh, and regarding BIPV, due to the nature of the module, um, um, it is like very suitable for BIPV applications, but there need there there's uh, there are some needs to there are some considerations to to be taken into account, um, which at the moment are being deliberated for future for future projects depending on, on market size, regulatory frameworks, etc. Uh, but yes, short answer is yes. Floating PV and and BIPV are uh, also applications we look into. Thanks for that. Um, I see a question about axing financing, so perhaps for, for you, Craig, to address, which is, is there a minimum percentage of U.S. content criteria for availing the, the U.S. axing financing? Well, that's, that's a great question. And we actually will finance whatever the U.S. content is. But having said that, one thing I didn't mention in my presentation, we also have language in our charter uh, to help uh, model competition. And, and so, uh, in that case, we were able, if, the, if at least 51% of the uh, contract is uh, U.S. supply goods and services, which for solar, I think their U.S. modules are about 6% U.S. content or higher, maybe 90. And so, you know, we're able to uh, crowd in a racking system, we're able to crowd in tracking systems, other uh, non-U.S. content. Well, thank you for the question. Thanks to you. There's a question for the first solar colleagues. I don't know which of the two wants to take it, but uh, it's a question whether the environmental footprint data that has been shown is published and available. So all the sustainable data is available on our website. So if you go and visit our website, you can find all the information there. Okay, thank you. A question, I think this one would be for Ashish. For solar has mm -hmm. adjusted this international footprint of the past year. How important are international markets such as Africa to your growth? Correct, so great question. And, and we get this question everywhere and every time. So all the markets are important for first solar. All the markets are critical for first solar. Um, having said that, we look at each and every project individually. We evaluate that project. We want to make sure when we are offering our technology, in that project in that particular country, it is really making difference uh, to the bottom line of the project and bottom line of the developer. Um, so on that basis, we always select project and offer our technology. There is no restriction on any, uh, any uh, geography or any continent or any country where we will not supply the product. Thank you. Um, and then one question for, for Leonel, I believe. Are there any major differences in the testing of thin film modules? Are there any specific certification for thin film modules? Can you can you shed some light about this? Mm. Yeah, well, as, as Ashish mentioned in his presentation, cattail thin film modules have been in the industry since more than 20 years. So there are uh, plenty of standardized uh, protocols uh, with the uh, with their respective specific considerations. Of the of the technology, um, but uh, all all our products comply not only with the common certifications asked in the industry, uh, but we also go beyond that. So uh, the modules go through extended test duration, sequential testing protocols, uh, application specific te specific tests, which uh, give additional insight to the long term performance, reliability, and and durability of the PV modules to to understand better and, and really evaluate the, the lifetime of the modules. And this is something, this is a criteria that, uh, that is quite interesting for, for the bankability of projects. So, but this goes beyond the certifications, right? But uh, 
Um, on, on the other hand, by understanding the technology, there are some, some tests that are not relevant for, uh, for thin film technology, as is the case for, for crystalline modules, uh, such as like electroluminescence tests or thermal imaging. So those tests are not relevant for us because as I showed in the, in, in the presentation, uh, our modules don't suffer from cell cracking and micro cracking, so no need to perform uh, those tests. So that's that's maybe a like one one major difference with crystalline modules. Okay, thank you, thank you very much for for the explanation. I see there's there's a few questions left. Uh, maybe one that might be of interest for everybody is whether the presentation will be shared, um, and the answer is yes. Both the presentations and the webinar webinar recording will be shared after the end of the webinar. Um, there are still some some other questions that uh, we won't have time to address, unfortunately. But uh, perhaps we can follow up with the participants um, after the the end of the of the webinar. So, thank you for this Q and A. Um, I would like to thanks thanks uh, thank you all for for joining and in particular the the presenters for for today's presentation i think it's been very insightful and i'm sure it, uh, it got uh, the attention of of our audience today so thanks to to the three of you in particular maybe just to say a few words about uh, our visibility opportunities at solar power europe you can enhance your digital presence with this kind of uh, online opportunities including webinar podcast newsletter online reports and executive interviews and if you're interested to do so please reach out to to our colleagues at business development for for hearing more about these opportunities and with this i would like to to congratulate for for this uh, successful webinar and uh, wish you a very nice afternoon thanks once again to to the speakers and i wish you a very nice afternoon thank you very much Rafael, and thank you to solar power europe